Okay, now we'll look at white blood cells, which are also known as leukocytes. Again, they have the characteristics that are about 5,000 to 10,000 per microliter of blood. Uh, we can divide the leukocytes up into a couple basic categories, uh, what are called the granulocytes. Those uh, mean that they have granules in the cytoplasm. So you can see granules here, here, and here. And the A granulocytes, A means without, right? So the A granulocytes, right? No granules in the cytoplasm, even though this drawing makes it sort of look like they do in the, the monocyte, there aren't any. There are three types of granulocytes and they all have the last name Phil. So that's the common thing about them uh, besides granules. Um, the three types are neutrophil, so here's neutrophils, eosinophil, and basophil. The agranulocytes, right, are the lymphocyte and the monocyte. So we'll kind of look at each one individually and uh, see what characteristics we need to know about each one. Okay, so look at the granulocytes first. The first one we're going to talk about is called a neutrophil again. Uh, neutrophils are called neutrophils because they have these neutral staining granules in their cytoplasm. Uh, they make up 60 to 70 percent of the white blood cells. So the vast majority of your white cells are neutrophils. Uh, besides having neutral staining granules, their other major physical characteristic is they have this multi-lobe nucleus. So here's a lobe, here's a lobe, here's a lobe, here's a lobe. So in this case, they have at least four. This one has at least four uh, lobes in the nuclei, so that tells us it's going to be a neutrophil as well. Um, they have a very, very short lifespan. Um, in active infections, they might only last literally a couple seconds. Once they're released into the bloodstream, they travel to the site of infection, uh, attack the invader, and uh, engulf it through phagocytosis, and are destroyed in the process, typically. So they're uh, very fast-acting uh, relative to some of the other uh, white blood cells as well. Uh, one of the things they can do is they're capable of diapedesis. So diapedesis, dia is a cross, ped is a foot, um, and esis kind of refers to process. So here's an example of diapedesis here. And what it means is that the uh, white blood cell can leave the bloodstream and enter the tissue. So what they do is they go ahead and find these little openings between the cells and um, they just go ahead and squeeze on through. So that's called diapedesis. We also see it down here as well. Um, so most of the white blood cells can actually undergo diapedesis, which makes sense because infections are going to be other places besides in the blood. And for them to be infective, they have to be able to leave the bloodstream, right, and go out into the tissue. Uh, so that's uh, diapedesis. Uh, their major function uh, is phagocytosis. So remember, phago is eating. Cytosis refers to cell in this case. So their job is to uh, engulf and destroy other cells. Um, they tend to be most effective against bacteria. As a matter of fact, the square is supposed to be an increase, a little arrow up. And so uh, if they increase number, uh, it's often a sign of a bacterial infection um, because your body will produce more of those. So in lab, we mentioned uh, a differential white blood cell count where we count the percentage of each of the five types of white blood cells. And uh, if you did a differential white blood cell count and you had a bacterial infection, you might see uh, you know, even a greater than normal amount of, of neutrophils or maybe you know, 75% of them of your cells might be neutrophils. So neutrophils are the first granulocyte uh, that we talked about. Eosinophils are the second of the granulocytes. Uh, they make up about 2 to 4% of all white blood cells. So, you know, they're not that numerous, although compared to uh, the next granulocyte we'll talk about, they're much more numerous than that one. Their physical characteristics uh, are that they have these reddish staining granules. So, see these little granules? So, I should probably do this. All right. 
Um, we're going to see little red dots all over the place. And those reddish staining granules, it's going to tell us it's an eosinophil. As a matter of fact, eosin means uh, red. Um, the other characteristic they have is they tend to have a bilobed nucleus. So here's a lobe here, here's a lobe here. So there's two lobes, and that's pretty consistent with what we see for an eosinophil. Um, like we saw with the previous one, the neutrophils, they're capable of diapedesis. They can leave the bloodstream, enter the tissue. Um, they uh, are especially effective against parasites, so they're good at a parasitic infection. So again, uh, like we saw with the neutrophils, they'll increase number if you have a parasitic infection. So sometimes if they can't figure out what's wrong with somebody and they do a differential count, and they see that someone has a high uh, eosinophil, uh, eosinophil count, then uh, they'll suspect that maybe it's some sort of parasitic infection. Um, the other thing they do, and pretty uh, important in terms of this, is they protect against hypersensitivity. Uh, hypersensitivity, what we would call every day an allergy. So that's an allergy. And... If you had an allergic reaction, one of the things you might go do is you might run to the store and get uh, Benadryl. Now, Benadryl, most people realize it's a brand name, but uh, what it does, it's an antihistamine. Okay, so it, it uh, blocks the effect of histamine, which we see rise with um, uh, allergic reactions. As a matter of fact, in severe cases, you can have so much histamine release that you can go into anaphylactic shock. So uh, it's going to get confusing in a minute, um, but uh, you know, make sure to remember that the eosinophils uh, release antihistamine. Okay, and so uh, that's going to help fight allergic responses. So that's the eosinophils. The last of our uh, white cells that are the granulocytes or the basophils. Um, they make up about you know zero to one percent of all white blood cells, and actually probably a lot less than one percent, so closer to zero than one. We don't have any man, very many basophils, and there's probably a good reason. There's a couple good reasons for that, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about their name. Uh, baso refers to dark or dark staining. And so basophils have these dark staining purple granules within the cytoplasm. Um, it has an S-shaped nucleus oftentimes, if you can see it, but in many cases it's called uh, occluded, that you can't even see the nucleus through these, these uh, the purple staining dark granules. So uh, basophils are interesting uh, as they're kind of different than most of the other white blood cells. Uh, they uh, cannot undergo diapedesis, so no diapedesis, um, and that's because they are functionally very similar to a group of cells in your tissues already called mast cells. And so basically, uh, it's a good example of uh, what happens in terms of physiology. Uh, if you often get something anatomically or, or physiologically, um, you have to give something up typically um, to kind of balance it out. So, you know, as an example, um, our one of the more more movable joints in the shoulder, uh, one of the more movable joints we have in our body is the shoulder. And the shoulder can do lots of different movements, but it's also one of the weakest joints we have in our body. And so you give up a little bit of strength in terms of getting more movement. And so we don't have the ability for basophils to leave the bloodstream. Uh, but that's okay because the mast cells do their job. As a matter of fact, when basophils were first discovered and looked at, they were called wandering mast cells because they essentially did the same thing. So since we already have cells doing that job in the tissue, there's no reason to modify basophils to do that job because it's already being done. So they're the only white cell that cannot leave the bloodstream. Um, they cannot go <clears throat> under diapedesis. Uh, they have uh, a couple functions, and it gets kind of um, uh, confusing. 
Um, but they actually are kind of opposite, or you can almost say antagonistic to the eosinophils. They enhance allergic reactions, right? So uh, along with allergies and things, they also enhance the inflammatory response. Um, so that's what happens when you, when you get injured, you have that inflammatory response. So you get the redness and the swelling and the heat and things like that. And so those are due to, to basophils. Uh, one of the more, more important things that basophils release is a chemical called histamine. Now, we saw a second ago that the eosinophils release antihistamine, but the basophils release histamine. Now, histamine is a very potent vasodilator. And uh, what would happen in terms of the inflammatory response is if you had an injury, uh, you would have basophils go to that area release histamine and that would cause vasodilation and when they had vasodilation that would increase blood flow and increase the amount of nutrients and increase the amount of uh, other things that would get to that area and help the, the repair process but histamine being a very potent vasodilator we can't have too much of it and so uh, one of the beliefs at least is why we don't have that many basophils is because if they all released histamine um, we could die um, that's what happens with uh, you know certain forms of systemic shock is when you have this huge release of histamine you don't get any blood returned back to the heart and uh, you could die that way so uh, uh, histamine uh, usually is only localized to the areas of injury where the basophils are um, besides releasing histamine, they also release uh, serotonin. Uh, serotonin, and this should be an arrow up, not a box, increase capillary permeability. So they make capillaries more leaky. As capillaries become more leaky, that allows the white cells that are capable of diapedesis to be able to get to the areas of injury. Uh, in addition, it enhances the swelling, uh, edema. Uh, so uh, that happens there. Uh, also, we release heparin. Now, we've seen heparin in lab. That's an anticoagulant, and it keeps blood from clotting, so, it, so blood continuously flows. It's not going to pre uh, uh, prevent, like if you had a site of injury, like a cut, per se, but it'll keep blood flow going to the area for the repair process uh, to continue. So basophils are, are very different uh, in terms of uh, how they behave, I think, in, in many ways. When you compare them to the other four types of uh, white blood cells so uh, just a, a quick little other thing and i mentioned this for the lab but we might as well mention it now uh, all of the granulocytes the basophils the uh, eosinophils and the neutrophils are in my mind i think of the size of a nickel so if i look at the different sizes of the different white cells we have just like a nickel dime and a quarter uh, we have the, the, the progressively getting bigger sizes. Um, so these are all of the granulocytes right here in this middle size. The basophil, the eosinophil, and the neutrophil all have about the same size. But we'll see in a minute when we talk about the granulocytes, uh, this small size um, typically is what we see with a lymphocyte. So that's a lymphocyte. And this large one is typical of a monocyte. So if I think about uh, the relative size of each, the lymphocytes are the smallest, they're the size of a dime. All of the granulocytes, the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils, are size of a nickel. And then the monocyte, which is the biggest one, is size of a quarter. So now we'll take a look at the uh, agranulocytes, those ones without granules in the cytoplasm. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the monocytes. And monocytes are, again, our first uh, agranulocyte. So this one does not have any granules in the cytoplasm. Um, it makes up about 3 to 8% of all white blood cells. Um, they're very slow acting. Um, but uh, they tend to be the, the stronger of the white cells, especially in terms of phagocytosis. So their physical characteristics, as I kind of said, they're the larger ones. So these are the ones that are size of a quarter. Uh, 
And typically they tend to have this very large pale nucleus that is often bean shaped or horseshoe shaped. So you can kind of see a nice bean outline there. Um, and that's an identifying characteristic of it. Um, they are also uh, produced not only in the red bone marrow, but also the lymph. Okay. And again, um, if it's produced in the bone marrow, it's called myeloid production. So myeloid, M-Y-E-L-O-O-I-D, myeloid. And if it's in the lymph tissue, where these can also be produced, it's called lymphoid. So, uh, so uh, myeloid would be the bone marrow and lymphoid would be the lymph tissue. So both uh, monocytes and uh, lymphocytes are produced in the lymph tissue and the bone marrow. So they both have both myeloid and lymphoid production. Um, they're by far the strongest of the white blood cells. They're the largest of the white blood cells. They last much longer um, than them. They are capable of diapedesis, so they can leave the bloodstream and enter the tissue. And in fact, you probably, even though you may not know you know them, you probably know uh, ones that are there. Um, so as an example, uh, normally, uh, if we have a monocyte that leaves the bloodstream through diapedesis, we actually change its name when it's in the tissue to macrophages. Macrophages literally means big eater. Um, so these are capable um, of phagocytosis. And sometimes they get a very specific name where they're at. So as an example, we have macrophages in the bone that go and uh, destroy bone tissue. And those are called osteoclasts. So an osteoclast at one point in time was a monocyte that left the bloodstream and entered the tissue. And now we call it, and resides in the bone tissue, and now we call it an osteoclast. Um, their function is to fight infection. Um, they're much slower um, than neutrophils, but they're much stronger and more effective uh, fight. So it's sort of like if you think about an army, um, the neutrophils are the uh, ones, if you saw Saving Private Ryan or um, Dunkirk or any of those other movies where, you know, you have the soldiers on the beach that are just getting, you know, shot up, you know, at the beginning, those are all the, the neutrophils and then the heavy guns that come in later and kind of uh, become a stronger, more effective force. That's what kind of you think about in terms of the monocytes they increase in number uh, during uh, chronic infection so if someone had a chronic infection um, they might have a high monocyte count so again that differential white cell count I have mentioned a couple times where they actually look at what's the percentage of the different white cells in your blood uh, if you had a chronic long-lasting infection the monocytes would probably be excessively high and finally, we have the lymphocytes. Uh, there's a whole bunch of subtypes of lymphocytes, and we're not going to worry about them in this class. In other classes, such as microbiology, which most of, but not all of you have to take probably, um, they'll probably go into more detail. So we're just going to look at them in a little bit of detail and not much, um, and kind of look at a, a couple different functions they have. But the lymphocytes, um, you know, they make up about 20 to 25 percent of all your white blood cells. Although, um, when you do a differential count from the actual blood, uh, they often don't hit this mark uh, because many of them are actually in your lymph tissue itself, uh, especially your lymph nodes and lymph nodes and things like that. Um, they have a couple nice physical characteristics. Uh, first of all. Um, they tend to be the smallest white blood cell. So when we talked about them in terms of uh, coins. This one looks like a dime. Um, it also tends to have a fairly, fairly large nucleus. So if you look at the nucleus size compared to the cell, it's pretty big. And just get this little bit of cytoplasm out here on the outside. Um, it tends to have a little darker staining nucleus than the monocytes, although it's not always circular classically. It is. Um, it also has both myeloid and lymphoid production. So since it's produced in the lymph, it's got lymphoid. Since it can be produced in the bone marrow, it's got myeloid production. 
Uh, lymphocytes are capable of diapedesis, right? So they can leave the bloodstream and enter the tissue. And again, the only white cell that can't do that, it's the easiest way to remember it, are the basophils. Now there's subtypes and then there's subtypes of those subtypes. Um, and the subtypes we're going to worry about just to know that they exist are T and B cells. Uh, T cells are what they call thymus derived. So they come from the thymus. Uh, B cells are bone marrow derived. Actually, they were first recognized in the bursa of Fabricas in birds. Uh, humans don't have that. Uh, you probably don't remember that from anatomy because we don't have that. Uh, but uh, the B still fits in terms of bone marrow. So uh, if it comes from lymph tissue, um, in terms of the thymus, it's called a T cell. And if it matures in the bone marrow, it's called a B cell. And then, you know, each one of these functions in, in different ways. So uh, we're not going to worry about connecting the different functions to the different subtypes. And again, there are, uh, uh, you know, different uh, subtypes of T cells and B cells. And there's, you know, plasma cells and natural killer cells and cytotoxic cells and, you know, a number of those, those other things. But... Um, we just have to worry about this, all right? So for us, some type of lymphocyte, that's all we're going to know. We're not going to worry about T or B, some type of lymphocyte. One of the things they do is they make antibodies. So we're going to stimulate antibody production from our lymphocytes. And so as an example, um, at some point in time, we'll develop a vaccine for um, the coronavirus. And that vaccine uh, will hopefully... Uh, cause people who have not been exposed to it yet to make antibodies so that if they get exposed to the coronavirus, they'll be able to, to fight off that infection much more effectively. Um, we also uh, see in the lymphocytes the ability to have immunomemory. Uh, immunomemory means that uh, our immune system will make memory cells. That, again, I'm not going to worry about which type, actually both though, but uh, we have these memory cells so that if we get um, attacked by that microorganism again, then our body has the memory to fight it off. Um, there's a recent study that said those memory cells in some cases last, last literally the entire life. So memory cells that you might have made when you were age, you know, one or two, uh, some of them are still actually with you right now. So that's kind of kind of interesting there. Um, we've also seen, um, you know, the other thing that uh, lymphocytes do is they're responsible for organ reject rejection. So if you were to get a transplant uh, of, you know, a kidney, a heart, whatever it is, um, then uh, we have to worry about organ rejection in terms of our lymphocytes. And that's why they try to look for a donor that has uh, a good match. Um, the less immunosuppressive drugs you have to give somebody... Um, the, the better off that will be and the closer match you have uh, from the physiology uh, then the uh, less rejection possibilities you'll have and the less drugs somebody will have to take. So um, lymphocytes do a lot of other things but those are kind of the big ones. So they make antibodies responsible for immunomemory, responsible for organ rejection. Here's a nice slide that uh, sort of summarizes the the different characteristics of our leukocytes um, and again going from most numerous to least numerous uh, and often cited mnemonic people use in anatomy is never let monkeys eat bananas the first letter of each word corresponds to the first letter of the different uh, types of white cells so the most numerous, never, N, would be neutrophils, 60 to 70%. L, let, lymphocytes, 20 to 25%. M, monkeys, monocytes, for 3 to 8%. Uh, eat, eosinophils, 2 to 4%. And the least numerous by far, basophils, which correspond to bananas, and they're about 0 to 1%. So this is a nice little chart that shows what they look like, gives you some basic functions and some characteristics of them and things like that. And finally, the other formed element we have not yet discussed are platelets. Remember, platelets are also known scientifically as thrombocytes. Uh, also, remember, they're not cells. They're cellular fragments. Um, and just as a, as a quick review, uh, 
Uh, they are made in the bone marrow. Uh, they are made like all, all other formed elements by that hemopoietic pluripotent stem cell. And in the case of platelets or thrombocytes, it eventually becomes a megakaryocyte that is stimulated by the hormone thrombopoietin. And once the megakaryocyte is made, uh, it eventually breaks up into these little tiny particles. So we see them here and here and here and here. Uh, and they're put in the bloodstream uh, as platelets. Um, so they're often called small fragments of a megakaryocyte, uh, which, so they're really not whole cells. Um, they're about 200,000 to 400,000 per microliter of blood. Uh, they are anucleate, which means they don't have a nucleus, uh, but they do contain an endoplasmic reticulum, which means they can produce chemicals, respond to chemicals, things like that. So one of the major things they do is they produce some clotting chemicals. They help aid in terms of the blood clotting. Uh, their function are clotting, literally, as we kind of mentioned before. Thrombo literally means clot, site means cell, so their whole name is clotting cell. And one of the things, just to kind of remember, is they can be activated uh, or inactivated. They normally are inactivated, but when they uh, get the proper chemical signal, they become activated. And what they actually sort of become like are little Velcro uh, particles. And they like to kind of stick together and aggregate. So under certain conditions, when they get the signal to clot, they will stick together and aggregate and form a clot. Um, that's probably all we're going to talk about thrombocytes uh, uh, in this class, and certainly, they, you know, certainly more stuff that uh, you can learn on them. But for us, we're good with just those things. Okay, and this is the last slide on the the blood uh, portion, and it just kind of summarizes the plasma and the formed elements and the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets. And it's kind of a nice slide, but I'm not going to go over. You can read it. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, you need to know more detail um, than that. Uh, one last little uh, piece of information as well. Uh, even though I split up these two lectures into the blood and the cardiovascular system, if you remember the beginning of this, and we'll probably see it at the beginning of the next section as well, that when we talk about the circulatory or cardiovascular system, blood is a portion of it, right? So if I, you know, ask, you know, what are the, the, the major portions of the cardiovascular or circulatory system, you would say the heart, the vessels, and the blood. So even though we've split it up for just class purposes into two sections, uh, it's actually all part of the same system.